Lisa Bess, uh, Tri County Co Chair Consumer Committee Planning Council. Your phones on mute. Um, 
and unmute when you wish to speak so that we don't um, hear the background in your space. Audience members? So, so. Hello, the Governor of Ryan Ms. Riles, the Multi Service Company Health Center. Randall Bruce, consumer member of IOC. Christina Rodney is hired, New York City Department of Health. Terrence Gervais, New York City Department of Health. Tara Miller, New York City Department of Health. <laughs> I'm Andrew Wood, uh, concerning citizen intervention and consultancy. Hi, I'm Matt Haney from the PSR. Thank you. If uh, any member of the public wishes to speak, we have a sign in sheet, and you're welcome to take that opportunity, which will be coming up very soon. Very soon. Um, Doria, will you lead us in a, a moment of silence, please? on those that we lost, on those that are still fighting the good fight, and for all of the circumstances that concern us in terms of what we've seen in violence in our country and, and with immigration and all kinds of things, can we please concentrate on how we can all make that better? Thank you. Daryl, um, David, will you go through the uh, minutes and then Daryl through the meeting materials? So everybody got the minutes well in advance. I did not get any corrections. Are there any corrections? Yeah, no corrections. And with all due respect to the research, uh, page 5, line 4, on the day after the meeting, you discuss the uh, move that the council sent a letter to the mayor of Brazil asking him to leave the city council fund uh, study. I think that was Paul that initiated that. Yeah. Although, well, this reflects the fact that we made the motion at the meeting. Right, and I think it was Paul that, that, that made that part of that motion and just somehow moved over. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to take any more reasons. Okay. Yeah. All right, we'll change that. Any other changes? Okay. We have a motion to accept the minutes for that one change. We're going to accept them. Is there a second? Second. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Second. All in favor accepting the minutes as have been amended. Opposed? The minutes are accepted. So, so good afternoon. After our minutes, we have a, a monthly grantee report, followed by the notice of award, which was already referenced by Jan. And then after that, we've got the um, summary statement, the objective review performed by Carissa on our grant. And you'll see uh, what the grantee talked about it, the notice of scores 98. After that, we've got the PSRE approved uh, fiscal year 18 spending plan, which will be presented, as well as uh, the actual plan, and an update uh, from Adrian Guzman on current topics in HIV law. And finally, a presentation from Sarah Ronstein and uh, her co PIs on molecular HIV surveillance and the new initiative at the department. Of course, our June calendar. Thank you, Daryl. Um, this is one we'll look at the June calendar. You'll see in um, uh, two committees are meeting twice next month um, uh, to for the rules of membership committee to finish that process of looking at the memorandum of understanding and then to begin the process of making recommendations for new appointments to next year's planning council. Um, and integration of care is also meeting twice uh, in June um, with the goal of finishing up uh, the food and nutrition uh, service directive. So June and July are our last two months and then we will be on a hiatus until either late September or early October. 
And I'm telling you this in advance because I'm just happening to think about it at the moment. When the council's not in session, the executive committee uh, functions on their behalf. And if something happens in August and September that there needs to be some action taken, we will reassemble the executive committee. If members of the executive committee, if there's not a quorum amongst the members of the executive committee, then in those circumstances, the elected leadership and the governmental co-chair are authorized to take action. It's only happened a few times, uh, but when it does happen, it's important for you to know that the council is technically in session 12 months out of the year. Um, we anticipate next year uh, bringing a number of issues to the table and to the various committees of the council. Um, we're looking forward to adding uh, a new staff member, which uh, will be announced to you probably sometime next month. Um, that will enable us to do many things that we and my staff, current staff, has not been able to accomplish um, simply because there's not enough time uh, that they can devote to those projects. Uh, so this year, uh, we've managed to accomplish quite a bit. But you'll see today in the spending plan that we'll continue, we continue to be challenged um, from Washington uh, with regard to the financing of all those things like this is just described. Um, but we have a backup plan, and I don't think that we should uh, let the reductions in our award uh, create a chilling effect on our desires to move forward, and our desires to be innovative, and our desires to fund our programs at a level of funding that uh, they deserve. Uh, so if you're interested in all of that business, um, you're welcome to join the Priority Setting Committee um, in its final meetings, as well as next year. Um, anyone that's a council member uh, is uh, encouraged to be a part of that process. Uh, and much of the work is intense, and it ends um, in the last four or five months of the session. But it gives you a really good sense of what we're spending our money on. And this council, it's your job to be the bookkeepers, to be the check signers, to fund programs that feed, house, and care for 15,000 people. You're the final arbitrators of all of that. The legislation empowers you in that way. So it's something not to be taken lightly. It's something to be knowledgeable about and be committed to. And that's what's unique about this community planning body. All right, we'll move into public comments. Are, are there any public comments at this time? All right, if not, you'll have the opportunity later in today's meeting to uh, avail yourself at that time. Graham? Thanks, Dan. Um, we have sort of a full grantee report, and much of the grantee report that you have in front of you has recently been updated in the last hour and a half, so we have fresh news. Here on the uh, grantee report it says the final notice of award is still pending, and we did receive the final notice, as you had mentioned. Um, we have a 3.1% reduction in our award. We have $95,799,000. $60 in our ward. Um, so we'll be sending out a side-by-side -side and comparing last year's award to this year's award, but I do, do know that there was a um, $300,000 reduction in MEI, um, and I'll have to send an analysis of the formula and supplemental awards and where those reductions um, are uh, occurring. Um, as you had mentioned, uh, we have done a lot of preparation for a reduction in the award. Um, we have had conversations with the New York State ADAP program and they're prepared to take reductions, so um, it should not affect uh, New York City or our Tri-County services or contracts. Um, but that those final decisions are still pending with the planning council. Um, we did receive, earlier this week, we received our last year's grant application score of a 98 with no noted weaknesses. 
the description of the um, it is in your packets. Uh, it looks like this, um, where they note, have no noted weaknesses and have mentioned a number of strengths in terms of our grant application. We continue to work for, um, to find those elusive two points, and we will continue to do that this year in the two application. But they don't give us many hints on where to find those two points, but we'll continue to do due diligence. Um, but according to conversations with HRSA, nearly every grant is between um, in the low 90s to high 90s in terms of the scores. So um, there isn't a lot of variation in, in these grant applications because um, people are sort of getting into the rhythm of what's expected of us. Um, also today, we received our full grant guidance, um, which looks like this. Uh, it's about 60 pages long. We, I have not reviewed that because that also came in the last hour and a half. Um, but we'll begin reviewing that and do a side-by-side -side in comparison to the previous year and determine what we need to do to write this year's grant application. Now, one thing that's changed in terms of the timeline for the grant application is that we're writing the application while the planning council is meeting. Usually, we write the grant application while the planning council is on recess. And so given that, uh, I want to be really clear that um, staff's priority is going to be getting us money for next year. And that that's where we will invest our time and our resources. Um, so if you aren't able to um, get the same level of response that you got from us before, please be patient and know that we're prioritizing getting money in the bank. So I appreciate the patience of that. Um, is moving on down, the Brian White HIV AIDS program uh, nationally did uh, announce Part C Early Intervention Services Award, um, uh, 2.8 million in Brian White Part C Early Intervention Services Awards to 10 geographic areas. Um, so there's a link there so that you can see the list of all 351 Brian White Part C grantees. So important news from Cursa there. Um, the 20, FY 2017 uh, closeout, the grant year that completed at the end of February 2018, that is complete. Um, and preliminary results show uh, another year of low understanding with $406,000 in very first. Uh, we recently released the Tri-County Tri RFP, it was released on May 25th. It includes eight service categories, including medical case management, medical transportation, psychosocial support, food and nutrition services, mental health, oral health, emergency financial services, and housing assistance. There will be a pre-proposal conference on June 8th held for this RFP. Um, people are encouraged to um, attend that session. <coughs> If you have uh, questions, please go to the healthsolutions.org website to view the RFP. Um, and if you have any questions about the RFP, there's a uh, PHS has an, an email address to address all your inquiries. Also, in regards to procurement, we announced our Ryan White Hair Coordination Awards on uh, May 23rd. Um, this is the result of procurement that was released on November 8, 2017. We have issued 25 awards for the care coordination programs, um, and a summary of those awardees is attached to the grantee report, along with information on the di geographic distribution of services. So that's the last two pages. Um, <coughs> So just to say a few things about that procurement, um, the Planning Council um, allocated money for case management, um, which resulted in this procurement. Um, we don't have the grantee, as you all know, doesn't have the authority to overturn any service category allocation decisions um, approved by the Planning Council. And so we ran the RFP, which resulted in these 25 awards. Um, Procurements are allows the DOHMH to identify new as well as existing contractors who can respond to emergency needs 
and priority populations and to fund emerging models known to improve health outcomes. Um, so as per our um, agreement with the Planning Council, we report all um, the results of any RFP to the Planning Council with the list of all agencies and those are included um, in this attachment. Um, just so you, just, <coughs> there is a, a summary of our procurement process. I can't answer any questions specific to our procurement, but I think this is important information to you, for you to know about how procurements are run and um, how we ensure a fair and level playing field for people to compete um, to have contracts to serve people with HIV. Okay. Questions about the character of each piece? Yeah. Contracts to ensure that 
finds our transition and supported in that transition. Um, you know, I, I, this is a large program, a big investment, um, and I, I, you know, this is what happens in a procurement. And I think uh, uh, it's it's a challenge in how it, it, it's how we run business with the planning council in terms of addressing the needs of people with HIV, and this is part of how that works. So, Yes. Yes. My last point um, related to this, you talked about the strength of the individual application and the response for it. We had previously had discussions at this council about the need to support uh, agencies as they write these applications, particularly agencies that don't have in-house grant support. And I just, um, I stated that at that time, and I just like to support, to reiterate if we do move forward or while we move forward with that, if we can include the public institutions in this because the public institutions that would be funded do not have grant writers. And I think that may have taken a big toll in their acceptance if it was not based on their past successful performance or the fact that they're cared for over 100 patients in these programs that we take that into consideration. So will you introduce yourself to Kevin after we have around? So I do have a question just because it wasn't clear to me if the response you gave her um, was sufficient when she asked you about what would happen then to the clients themselves on programs that are no longer funded, but they're being continued to care. You know, perhaps they enter the program of this year, and they're still at it, and now they're not funded. So what do we do with that issue? Is there a process of transferring people? Do you have something? Or, you, or <clears throat> the limit of your work is still recurring in, you know, in the RP and sending the money that you, that's it, as to the care that happens to the client that's beyond your scope. In, in closing out a program, we ensure that clients are transitioned, um, and that's 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 how we manage that. I, I'm not. I mean, they, I can't say more than that. I'm oh, just, so okay. so that makes so your answer is that beyond that statement, there's nothing more you can offer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is making me kind of recall that conversation that was had about the smaller agencies that may not have a grant writer. I know that there was discussion, but I think that there are some nuances that um, do lend themselves to, yes, you have staff that can fill out applications and things like that, but when it comes to language and intent and understanding, when you have someone that specifically works on a grant in a particular organization, as opposed to a staff member that is doing an add-on of, of doing a, a, an RFP, it's not the same thing. And I do remember that we did discuss that sometimes these smaller agencies I served on a nonprofit that you can go to a bigger, more organized institution, they will provide the service, but that's what you get is a service. What you get with more um, private, smaller groups is people get to know their clients very well. The clients are comfortable with the staff, and I think that um, even though it sounds like they did well, the fact that they are not going to be continuing is a little concerning because transition of consumers just means that for some organizations it's just a notification that you might get in the mail 
that this program is no longer available, and here is a reference for you to go to another agency. Now, does that agency mean, does that mean that agency is in your community? Does that mean that they are easily accessible? Does it mean that the requirements that another agency has that this agency may have had are going to um, be the same? Will they lose clients and things like that? I do think that what you brought up was um, a legitimate concern, and I think that maybe that needs to be really more considered in the future. I did hear, Graham, that you did say that there was um, tremendous, I mean, support for those agencies. I, I don't know um, what that is, but maybe there are other recommendations for them to fill the gap that they are losing because that also means that they're going to lose numbers and clients from their agencies. Thank you. Christopher? And I have a comment to that and then a separate question. Um, but to solve into your question or your concern, and if you remember in care coordination, just remind me of the actually, to be in care coordination, um, you have to get a referral from a primary care doctor. So these agencies that no longer have their contract, the patient will hopefully be transitioned to the private goal to an internal case management program. There's health home models, there's other non right way <coughs> Care, uh, care managers as well, or the patient may choose to leave the institution and go to a primary care site that does have care coordination. Just that there's multiple ways that that can um, work out. Um, I just wanted to clarify that for you, and I hope that the grantee would help the agencies and close out make those decisions. I just wanted to clarify that. Second question, um, just you know. I am a funded agency, and there are two phases to the new, uh, new model. So I'm just reminding people that, that in August, the new contracts will start according to this, but not everyone will implement the new the revised plan that we voted on a few months ago, or I guess last year, actually. Um, so can you speak to that two-phase rollout, um, and are you able to identify which agencies will be part of the first phase and which agencies be part of phase two. I, I don't have the phase one, phase two agency assignments on me here, um, but I'll explain how it works. Um, if uh, in the procurement and in the consent paper, um, we were clear that uh, we were going to evaluate the model, the revisions of the model, um, by doing a two-stage phase-in of previously funded programs. So, um, and we, those previously funded programs should not be determined until the results of the procurement. So when we have the results of the procurement, we randomly pair and assign um, contracts to phase one or phase two. Phase one starting August 1st, in phase two starting May 1st, 2019. Um, and so these are previously funded programs. But those who were starting on August 1st will start the new model and be trained in the new model, which includes a different reimbursement mechanism, which is fees for service, which includes um, specific um, client-centered um, health promotion, uh, as well as self-management assessment, um, some new uh, virtual options for directly observed therapy. Um, the, the main piece is that I remember changing the model. Um, and then the other folks who are starting will continue um, to serve people in the model they're contracted for now, the previous model, and then they will change models May 1st, 2019. If you're a, a new program, you will start with a new model with a, a contract on August 1st, but you'll be trained in the second wave because of those programs need to hire new staff. Right. And can I follow up with you online for I'm just curious what you see. I have a question with regard to people that are accessing these services. Many of the most vulnerable of our populations. Are they Will they know that they're, uh, if they're new, uh, coming into an old program as opposed to a new program? So will these patients know that this guy down the street is getting X, Y, and Z, and I'm getting X and Y? 
when a study like this is, is done of it's a, patients, it's not a con how, do we, not, how do we manage that? It's an evaluation of a service model, and there are it's a family of contracts that is funded with the current <coughs> service model, and it's a family of contracts that are, and those will transition to the new service model. We don't, the, the changes in the model haven't been studied. We don't know that um, it gives anyone a specific leg up in terms of improved health outcomes. We made those changes believing that these are the right changes to make in that model, but we are, we are it's not like um, a randomized controlled trial where some people get the treatment for X disease and some people don't. It's, it's not that specific in terms of the changes in the model. So that that's how, and, and it's, a, it's a service evaluation. It's not it's not the same thing as a randomized controlled double blind trial. That, that's, I think that's what you're referring to. I know we've had long, long conversations about this. The point that Christopher made about the ability to do directly observed therapy using a video phone, using your smartphone, or using Skype, or whatever means that the patient has that works with the uh, person who's delivering the service. That's very unique and specific and helps address uh, a multiplicity of problems that uh, people that are uh, administering these programs face with regard to having to go to someone's house, and go through that process of directly observed therapy. And, and, and the committee studied that issue in depth. And so now we have new people coming in this program that uh, are people coming in this program that that particular element, um, if they go to the wrong place, will not be available to them. So it, to me, it, it's it's a challenge in that you you know there's this disparity now because of the creation of the study that that newer people coming into this program just by happenstance where they end up whatever door they enter may benefit from the work that the integration care did, committee did in in creating a new service model or not. For a, for a, pain, a, a lengthy period of time. The desire on your part, on the, on the part of the department and on the part of the grantee, to study this new model and to see if we can measure some effective differences, um, I don't think that we had that conversation in the Integration and Care Committee. And it seems to me that the six or eight month process that we went through examining the old service model, inviting providers in, talking to consumers, doing literature reviews, analyzing information from eShare, analyzing performance and utilization data, and having the co-chair be a person who's running one of these programs. After that lengthy discovery process that led us to the creation of a new model, I would say we studied the model. And that, that why would, it, why would the grantee take it upon itself to study the model again? What if you find out, after all this effort that we made, that the model that we've created is inferior to the older model? What happens then? We'll report back to the planning council. But I want to be clear that the process that we went through to do the two phases was um, communicated in the concept paper. Um, and presented at a community forum. We did not receive negative feedback on the double phase. The application for the evaluation received also included a, um, a letter of support from the planning council co-chairs that clarified this two-phase model. So this, this process has, there's, it's been transparent that we are doing this. Um, and it, is part, it was part of the procurement, um, and here we are. And, um, we will, you know, a, the wonderful part of this project is that this is the most well-studied case management program in the nation. 
we have more resources to figure out what works and what doesn't, and that's part of what fed into the new procurement. But we'll be able to also see if what we did change works. We're in a really great position. Um, and I think we should be proud of that. So. I'm not trying to give you a hard time, right now, All right. because we're on the same team. I'm just trying to make uh, bring some clarity to exactly what you brought to the table. About an understanding on the part of the, of the chairs of the council and the, the nature of the study, but also kind of the, I guess, just definitions of, of uh, the terms that we're using, the measurement comparing one study to another, and whether it's effective or not effective, and, and how best can we accomplish that. And, and then the concept or just the notion that I think members who are part of the integration of care committee. Uh, uh, embrace is that when we bring a service model to uh, the grantee to then be um, languaged in an RFP and contracted in the community, I think generally we all agree in the committee that we've done our homework and that the model that we're presenting to you is the model that we'd like to see executed um, without, you know, some no layer imposed upon it, the questioning of it. So that, that's my point here. And, and I don't know whether Christopher agrees with me about it, but I just think looping back to um, Eunice's question, looping back to previous conversations we've had about the whole procurement process, the contracting process, what it is we can and cannot talk about, um, I think leaves open, makes us vulnerable because we just don't have the information that I think that we, we could uh, benefit from. So I would propose to the council that during the next session that we bring in people from the city, city's uh, procurement department, this DCAS, um, to give us a one-on-one -on, -one on procurement, to talk about what's a procurement process consist of, what does contracting consist of, because I think we all have different concepts of what that means. Those of you who are holding a right in my contract, you, you understand it. But there's a lot of people at this table that don't. And they don't understand how, you know, we contract our services to the city. What are the rules we have to follow? How is that all set up and structured? How, how are proposals reviewed? Who reviews the proposals? On what basis are the decisions made? I don't think it's clear to everyone in the council how that all works. You're not revealing any trade secrets here, it's all public information. But I think it's helpful for us to understand that once we pass on this work to the grantee to implement, here's the steps that you all have to go through in order to bring us to the place where we are today with the listing of the agencies and the contracts and where the dollars are going. So internally, um, I have um, staff and admin are creating a PowerPoint that describes the procurement process for my staff who aren't involved in writing procurements. Um, so I'd like to offer that we all share with um, that slide set um, with you to be able to um, understand the procurement process. Uh, we have. Uh, we have a unique arrangement with the master contractor. And if we get our slides from the city, though PHS follows the city procurement rules, there will be pieces that you won't understand. Um, and I think it would be best for us to make a specific slide set that is specific to the Ryan White um, services and the master contract that we have with public health solutions. Um, that, that information is embedded in the summary of awards that I've shared with you today. It's embedded in the RFPs that we solicit that are all available for you to read. Um, but I think it would be helpful for you to understand how do we ensure a level playing field and how do we review those applications and how does it result in awards. And we're very careful and deliberate with that process. Um, but I think it would be helpful for you to all understand how that works. To do that. Yes, and then Daniel. If I can just add, I completely support that idea. I think there should also just be some clarity on sort of the pros and cons of different decisions that are made. Mm -hmm. So if we're saying um, we, we want to level the playing field and we define it this way, how 
past performance doesn't count, this doesn't count, that doesn't count. We should have a clear view of what those decisions are. Because I think the department has done a wonderful job following the planning council guidance. I just want to make sure the planning council is doing what they, you know, in their guidance is aware of what the pros and cons of these decisions are. Particularly as money gets tighter and tighter and these things become more and more competitive, it's just going to be a harder and harder playing field as the money gets smaller and smaller. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it seems that you know there are two issues here, and the procurement is, is one. But um, what I want to call attention, and, and it's more of a question as well, is um, I don't see it in the integration of care committee. Um, so as as a member of of a larger planning council. My assumption is that when we vote on a service model, that that is a service model that is going to be uh, funded and implemented. Um, in this case, that doesn't happen. Um, so the question is, what's the process that we have either to approve or, uh, or, or refuse that? Um, what's, what can prevent us from voting on a service model that is going to be implemented in a different way? So in this case, it's the service. So next month, we vote, in a, vote for a different service model. How can I be sure that that service model that is going to be implemented and funded, funded and implemented? And, and I'm not clear that there is a process about that. Um, and again, sitting here on, on, on the sidelines, for, for, for me, struggles on is that if I see uh, the, what the integration of care committee submits here for, for proposal, and that's what I'm voting on. So I have certain assumptions, and if these assumptions are incorrect, there should be then a, a clear um, process for, for, for that, for saying uh, uh, what you are voting on is in a, is in a two step process, or we are conducting a study on this on this model, and that's what we were voting on, and that's what the integration committee, integration of care committee, brought to the table. That you are going to have a service model that is going to be studied. But I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that from the integration of care committee. I heard from the integration of care committee saying this is the model that we want. To follow. And the reason you didn't hear it from the committee is we didn't know that until the concept paper came out, so after this committee approved the model. So this two-phase implementation was a surprise, and, and Graham, I, I don't know if, I can't speak to other agencies, but I know that Mount Sinai did have a lot of questions about phase one, phase two, not contesting it, we were, you know, but we did have a lot of questions at the committee meeting and the follow-ups around this two-phase, how this, was this a true study? Because I don't know yet, it's still unclear to me, is this really, it's not a randomized control trial, but you've talked a lot about random assignment. So I think that's what's confusing some people, and maybe just can clarify, is this in fact a study where you're comparing two program models against one another to see if it does result in better health outcomes for one, um, or is this just a simply an implementation <coughs> tool because it would be much more challenging to you know, implement a brand new model um, all at the same time, and you know, so that's my first question while I have the mic, sorry, please. Um, the real big difference in the model, there's not that big of a difference, you know, in the program model in terms of services provided to patients. There really are two big changes. Um, one is the introduction of a self-management assessment. And the thought process behind that was patients stay in care clinician sometimes for a very long time. And as a provider, we're not always sure when is it appropriate to graduate someone from the program. What makes them a self-manager? What makes them ready to do this on their own? Different programs make that decision in different ways. So I think the introduction of self-management assessment is interesting to see how does that impact the length of the program, um, that it focuses your conversations on self-management. I think that's one big change, and I think worth comparing. Um, the second is how people are reimbursed. So the track system that we spent a lot of time talking about, meaning patients are in this weekly track, monthly track, quarterly track, have different rates assigned to it, is no longer there for patients 
and if we're enrolled in or for programs that are starting this new model. It's a fever service model. I mean, you get reimbursed based on the types of services you provide somebody. I think that's worth looking at to see cost effectiveness and all of that. Um, so my question is, there are certain services like the DOT over the phone, which agencies won't get reimbursed for in the current model. Um, a, a case conference over the phone with a social worker at another agency, not currently payable in the current model, but will be in the model. Is there like little tiny tweaks that make sense? We're already doing them, right? People do you do DOT over video conference. We just don't get reimbursed for it. So, you know, I'm just curious if there's if some of those differences could be looked at in agencies that aren't in phase one could implement some of these things or um, have permission to do those things. Case finding would be another big one. You know, so I'm just curious, like, there are some really big changes in the model and these little tiny tweaks that just were patient-centered that for, to tell an agency you have to wait 14 months or 13 months to start doing that just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Sorry, no, that is there is like a lot of questions in there. Okay, so um, first, 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 everyone gets the new model. Everyone will be on the new model by May first, twenty twenty-two. I want to be really clear about that. Everyone will be following the guidance issued, the new guidance issued by the Planning Council. Everyone who continues on the old model until that March first. Um, sorry, May 1st, 2019, it's following the previous service guidance issued by the Planning Council. The, the, the reimbursement model that people are currently under evaluates the threshold of services. So you could be doing services, um, so it's like a bundle of services, as you know. So you could be doing those services um, as long as it's part of that bundle and you'll get paid. Um, the two phases is about evaluating the, the changes in the model we um, ensure and inform best practice in terms of how do we serve people in care coordination. And that is what we're evaluating. Um, so that in, in my mind, Daniel, your question was how do you ensure that we're following the guidance? It's because you've written guidance and you've given to us and we use that to write the RFP. Yeah, but the, the, so re recently. Yeah, but the, the question is: is uh, I totally understand that there is a there is value to the evaluation point, and, and I totally understand that about the changes and all that. But my question is not about is not contesting the validity of the study or contesting the process of how how it's going to be implemented. The question I, I, I have is, what's the process? So if I, if, is this, if I bought on a, a model, should I assume that that's the model that is going to be funded and implemented? Or should I su assume that it's a suggestion that is given and based on whatever feedback is given in, in, a, in a open forum or, or through email, that that model might change, might be implemented in a different way. So what's the, what's, what's the process that we have internally here to decide that that is what's going to be implemented in the, in the way that we are expecting without changes? And that, that is what's resulting in this procurement, is the guidance that was issued to the grantee that everyone will be implementing a program result following that guidance. Not quite, because you're talking about delay. Well, so, the delay is people continuing on their previous contract. Correct, but when so I bought there it, are times when, when I bought it, and you bought a, 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 a model plan with a delay, there was nothing that there when I bought it for that model that says this model will be implemented with a delay. That's that is true, and as I had said, there was a letter signed by the Planning Council co-chairs where there was recognition of this value, this study. There was also, um, you know, it was outlined in the concept paper. Um, we were transparent about this, and here we are. Um, 
So, and, and everything that we have in a contract is follows, following guidance issued to us by the planning council. And everyone will be following the guidance issued by the planning council for care coordination by March, uh, May 1st, 2019. Uh, place so that, that is, I, I can't change what that is, but that is the truth of what we have. We have to draw off each other. Um, this is not the end of this conversation, Blaze. Okay, yeah, I'll try to be quick. Thanks, everyone. <coughs> um, so, um, so, like, so A, I hear a lot of people's concerns, both from Jan and from Christopher and Daniel about, like, the different service models, right? Patients getting different types of care and care coordination. And I agree, you know, we need to develop this and I was a part of that. I also will announce that I got funded under the Brooks of Palm Lord, got funded under the Ryan White Parade. And we're not part of the phase two, which is a, a it's experimental model. Um, that, they, yeah, I think those are really valid concerns to think about, you know, like how are we impacting patients differential of patient care, and then um, there are really small tweaks that are just really super patient-centered that that's the thought process behind holding on from those. I do want to say on the other side, though, is that, um, you know, these grants are huge, and this grant, I think, especially is a huge administrative burden on staff, and often has a negative impact on patient care. And, and in many ways, it's not always patient-centered, <coughs> And even changing the model in this way is going to be, because it is new, a huge administrative burden on, on staff that I do think can have a negative impact on the patients. Um, trying out a new model, trying out to do different ways of, of billing for services, doing a fee for, fee for service kind of model, which is not what we've done in the past, changing the rate in, in time that we're meeting with patients to make that less structured could have negative, negative impacts on patient care. It could be less of a strong model, even though I think we have a lot of ideas for how to improve it. And, you know, while I was really excited about trying to do model, I, I got to be a part of putting it together and, and think I have a lot of belief that it, it is a better model. I am, on the administrative side, kind of relieved that we can implement a program that we know how to implement and feel really strong about for another year, while there's a group of agencies that go through testing, kind of, I think, what could be a really administrative burden, and get that ironed out so that when it does come to how and Lord, we are learning from people that made all the mistakes in the last year, so that we can implement with our patients tried and true, in some ways, learning from the mistakes that were made with a smaller subset. It still needs different patients are getting different types of care, and that's a concern. But maybe in the end, for the bulk of patients, there's less of a negative impact on, on the change. So that's another side of this. Uh, so it's all on that, Christopher, and then we need to wrap this up. OK, great. <coughs> so two, three things. One, just because I want to make clear, you ask the question, what is it? Is it a study, an evaluation? What are you calling it this time frame right? between implementing everyone into the, what do you call it? <coughs> it's an evaluation. Okay, so that's one. It's an evaluation. There's no consensus. No, it's not called study. So what do you expect, what are you going to do with the outcome of this evaluation? What, so you're implementing the RP by the night, by May 19th? Okay. What was it? May 19th? May 1st, 2019. May 1st, 19. So you do a revision, there is an outcome. What is the impact that of that information with the when everyone gets in implementing the new What is it? What are you planning to do with it? So um, so the the funding that we receive for this evaluation is a, a new grant that is not Ryan White funding, and it builds on the information that you've re been receiving to inform the new model, um, which is a result of a court study. And so that is an evaluation of the model that exists now. And you have used, you, you may not have realized it, but you've, you've been using data from that effort to be able to inform the new model. 
And that's what you, you will do with this new evaluation, which is using data that we will share with you to inform um, improve, improvement in the care coordination model. Meaning that the care coordination plan that is being implemented by May 1st, 19th, is not going to be affected by the outcome the, of the information you're getting from here. It's until we produce a new RFP that that information will be utilized to improve the other one. Uh, it, it matters how big a change is. Maybe it would be, I don't know, there might be some um, data that we see that where we just need to do a tweak to the work that we're doing with the program, so that would lead to improvement. And that tweak will be done by you, or is it going back to us to tweak the directive, or is it a tweak that is? It, it matters how specific of a tweak it is. If it's like, it, if it changes eligibility, or it's a whole new type of service, absolutely, you can't add that. But if it's a change in the number of times we provide health promotion, yeah, that's not something that would be in the directive. So that means so we, we review the guidance, we review the RFP, and we figure out what what is allowable and what is not allowable in the current post year. The only thing I will say at this point is that it will be interesting for you to have explained this a little bit in the matter that you're doing without me having to ask. Because all this conversation is so confusing, but if, for example, why is it you have to wait till uh, Christopher asks you, what is it? What is the name of it? You could have just called it what it was, or perhaps made a clear that it's not a study. It's not, and perhaps you did, but it, at least for me, it wasn't clear. Until you asked, and then you don't respond until I ask again. The second thing is with the outcomes. It's interesting that you know you, we're going to implement something and you determine it to be May 1st, next year. Uh, the question everybody has been asking is not really what you're being answered, because their, our concern has been something to do with, are we doing our job correctly? And if it's so, why is it not being implemented as such? Uh, yet, you're, you are coming from another end. So again, we have a conversation in which we still don't have an answer to satisfy this impulse to say, you know what, I, I, I can't trust anymore because I'm not getting an answer to the question implicit. Can you tell me what the question? Well, is? the question was in key, was asked by it was asked by Daniel again. Are we doing our job? But then the question was when you you decided to do this evaluation, which is you know it's it's up to you. It's, there's not, to me, I don't find it wrong. It's what I find com complicated is that we keep asking the same question, yet the answer seems not to satisfy because you keep asking it. I don't what is, what is the question. What is the question? I think the question is, can the planning council or the integration of care committee direct the grants you know, how, how to implement or when to implement the model? Because this is the first time we're seeing two concurrent models happening at the same time versus in the past, when something's been rebid, it kind of all happens overnight, it happens at the same time. That was, and then we so didn't see it until the concept paper. So, so and and my answer to that question is, I, I don't know. And we, we had several opportunities where we communicated it and where we had opportunities for feedback. And so what we are saying is, we responded to that feedback with additional information in the RFP so people would understand. So, so this is what I plan now, right? It's, it, it, if I have a good understanding, so the integration of care committee sent a model that was approved by the council, right? At that point, my expectation is that, as someone who voted for it, my expectation is that that's what, that's what's going to be funded and implemented. However, what I'm hearing is that because there was no negative feedback to that change, and because there was a letter from the two co-chairs, that, that suffice to make the change. So the question for me in terms of the process then is that what precludes future changes once this committee, this the, the, the large the, 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 the large body approves a model. So what confidence I have that what I'm voting on is what's going to be implemented. What confidence I have that the next time uh, we 
approved an HTTP case, sorry, a, a case management model that is not going to be decided that uh, it's going to be implemented in three phases, or that there is going to be a delay of a year, or that there is going to be uh, a, a, an add-on to it. Uh, even, if, even if we follow the guidelines, but there is a delay, so there was a change in how it's going to be implemented. And if, 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 if. the answer is that that ultimately is going to be decided by, by the leaders of the co-share, I'm fine with it. But that has to be explicit. And I don't that kind of understand the process. So I, I think this is a very unique situation, and it deserves more time, which we don't have at the moment. And David, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that in the past, when we, when we issued service directives, we had the expectation that when the RFP was written and when the uh, procurement happened and when the contracts were settled and the services began, that that service model would be implemented across the board. But because we have a evaluation in play, um, that's created a two-tiered process in uh, implementing the new directive. So I think this is unique because I don't recall this happening in previous service directives. And, and there's a backstory to this that we haven't explored here yet uh, about the, the, the funded uh, evaluation of these two models. Um, and so we'll, I, I think the best way to proceed here in order to get the rest of our business done today is to come back next month with a, a, a allowing more time to explain the letter that Nat and I signed with regard to evaluation, which then created the situation that we're all debating here. Um, and uh, I would, I would uh, seek the permission of the council to do that if you agree with me that we need to move on with the rest of the agenda. Yes. 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 All right. It should be done as new business. Not be able to take over the agenda. Okay, so let's uh, let's move to the next item, which is uh, our current spending plan. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Shannon and I are here to present the CSRA approved this year 2018 spending plan. As it's a slide for just a projection, um, she and I were going to kind of divvy that one slide for each person, and we decided that's not a good thing because I wanted the first slide and leave her everything else. So <laughs> we're going to do a little different way. So, Shannon, take So, quickly to review, um, you've seen some of these slides before. Um, we're going to review the, the history quickly that New York State is um, expecting to increase their allocation to ADAP. That relieves the uh, Part A EMA allocation um, and allows us to, to think about um, other uses for those dollars. Um, and that we believe that, that from what we learned from Christine Rivera, but that, that this will be true for the foreseeable future. So we're not only talking about um, additional allocation available for this year's spending plan, but also for future spending plans. Um, so we've been talking about a reduction strategy that, first of all, um, includes absorbing expected cuts to the award. And as we saw today, we had a, we experienced a three percent cut, which was a little bit higher actually than what had been initially presented um, in the forecast. Um, we also, you know, hope to have the dollars to address longstanding needs and what have been pre prioritized previously in application spending plans. And this specifically applies to food and nutrition and to housing in Dry County. Um, and that we also want to be looking at enhancing allocation to service categories that have consistently overperformed. And overperformance is a proxy for uh, consumer need in this case. So additional points to keep in mind in terms of reduction set, uh, strategy, um, we're interested in a step down approach so that we're being um, cautious and, and conservative in how we look at these dollars. We also need to be um, thoughtful about not flooding um, our portfolios with dollars that can't be spent and resulting in lots of underfund, uh, underspending. Um, and creating those administrative headaches. So 
Um, we are looking at keeping money allocated to ADAP in both base and MAI so that we can um, absorb cuts um, to the award and absorb carryover. Um, and that we're going to continue to make changes based on need and performance in you know, the years to come. Uh, and that we will Yeah, and that we'll also be looking at potentially um, funding new initiatives um, with these uh, monies that are being freed up from, from ADAP. Um, what, we're, what we approved last month was that we would, um, we approved that we would use the ADAP allocation to absorb reductions to the grant award of up to 5%. And in your packet, you have a scenario that shows a uh, cut of 2%, which David has updated um, to, to be the actual 3.1. OK, so unfortunately, as Rand said, we got the numbers from her so, so soon before this meeting, we weren't able to uh, reprint these spending plans. But this council did approve using uh, ADAP to absorb a cut up to 5%. Uh, as Grant reported, as Jan just reiterated, the uh, cut actually ended up being 3.1%. So just to, um, if you take your spending plans out, uh, I'll tell you what the exact numbers would be. <coughs> so row, uh, column E is in the top uh, left corner is last year's award, 2017. Uh, you see it divided in minus four and five from the base and AI. So the new numbers this year on base award is now 86,894,962. And we'll, I'll send a revised version of this out by email to everybody. It will also post it on the website once it's finalized. Uh, so anyway, that is a reduction in our base award of 2,768,046. That would be the new number in column F, row <coughs> four. So column uh, F, row four, the reduction from 17 to 18 in base is 2,768,046. Um, okay. Then line underneath that, we got a reduction in NAI of 302,666 for a new MAI award of 8,904,098. So our new total award is now 95,799,060, which is a reduction of 3,070,712, or 3.1%. And we'll, we'll send out the revised version to everybody. But this was approved by the council as a methodology last week. Uh, additionally, at the April, thank you, David. Additionally, at the April 26th meeting, we um, approved the use of the AM allocation to fund Tri County Housing at an additional $330,000. That's $300,000 for, for the housing and $30,000 for the admin. It goes along with it. Um, we also, at that meeting, proposed um, an increased allocation for food and nutrition services, which did pass. And um, the council requested that, uh, uh, that PSRA take a, a look at, well, actually, what happened was a executive council that didn't pass, and so um, we went back um, to PSRA, and in addition to looking at food and nutrition services, which has overperformed and um, for which there is uh, a lot of information from consumers and providers about the need to increase rates, um, we also were asked at PSRA to look at overperforming, other overperforming service categories, uh, and uh, there are four altogether, food and nutrition, legal, supportive counseling, and TCC. So PSRA went back and took a look at, at all the overperforming categories. Can I interrupt you for a moment? So what you see here is a process, this is the work of the executive committee. 
the work of the Immigration Committee needs such a priority setting. Come to the Executive Committee for review. That's, that's one of the primary functions. And in the delivery of a plan that had been supported by priority setting to the Executive Committee, which would then be passed on to this committee as it is being today, done today, the members of the Executive Committee had substantial questions about that plan, the first plan. And in, in their role as overseers of much of the work that comes to this table, uh, and the vetting of that work be before it even comes to this table, they ask that the committee uh, review, the, uh, come up with an another plan. Did it take into consideration these other overperforming service categories? Um, and to, to look at them and then come back. So what's happened now is they brought, they did that, and they brought it back to the executive committee, but at the time, we didn't have a quorum. So now there's, they, 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 they presented it to the executive committee, and there was consensus that the, the plan should be brought forward, and it's now being presented directly to the council from the priority setting committee. So this is based, this is plan B compared to plan A. And all that is to say that the way the council is structured and the way the work gets done is that there are three levels of vetting. Uh, there's the vetting work that's done in the individual committee. There's a review of that work done in the executive committee. And then once it comes to this table, it's once again laid out in front of everybody in this room for your review and approval. And, and that's where we are now with this plan. Thank you, John. Uh, so the process that we took was uh, uh, prepared. So this is a graph that shows us um, overspending um, over the last four years um, for the four consistently overperforming portfolios. And um, you can see the, the years are in different colors and um, there are dots that represent the average overspending for each of those uh, categories. So after a very, um, I think, very rich discussion at PSRA um, that was, you know, everybody at the table contributed um, greatly to this discussion. Um, the decision, or PSRA recommends and, and voted to uh, voted to approve that we move ahead with increasing the rates uh, for food and nutrition. Um, and that those rates would be increased by 30.33% for an amount of uh, $1.837 million. And that this is consistent with identified priority to increase food quality. And um, this is a, a, an issue that's consistently come up um, at a number of venues. Um, and so in future, so the original proposal had included an increase in capacity. Um, and so that's something that we, we hopefully will be able to look at in future years. So we are currently, at PSRA is currently recommending the increase in um, allocation to increase average cost per client. Looking at other overperforming categories, um, we're looking at legal and, um, and proposing and approved to um, sort of choose the methodology in terms of how we determined the recommendation for increased allocation was for legal to um, choose the lowest amount of overspending um, in, among those four years, FY13 to 16, and that amount is $406,472. Looking at supportive counseling, um, the methodology that we adopted was to look at the average amount of overspending in those four years, um, in particular noting that um, there was one very, very low um, year, um, and that was the year when the category was rebid, and um, didn't make sense to choose the lowest amount because it really wouldn't um, have any noticeable impact on the capacity of those programs. Um, we, we've received um, 
feedback that the TCC program model really needs to be uh, revised and are recommending that we, we wait until that revision is done to look at the allocation for that portfolio. So just to make an a, a important point about the increases to the to legal and supportive counseling as well as the food and nutrition is that these are performance-based contracts, so these, these portfolios, so the contractors overperform um, this year, they will be able to be, if there is money still available in those portfolios or, or uh, CMAY, they will be eligible for additional funding. Um, so just to keep that in mind. So this is the um, this is the recommendation, and this has been updated to reflect the new um, service dollars. Um, so that's not an estimate anymore; that's an actual of uh, the 78 million. Um, so we are proposing the food and as as stated. We're, Proposing the 1.837 for food and nutrition, the 339.501 for supportive counseling, and the 406.472 for legal. So, questions? IOC, and I know that this is for other programs, but we've heard there are people struggling for food. 
We know there are people struggling for legal services. Um, you know, we heard from another program that in reality, the more appropriate funding would be to add another attorney to each program. And it's not just immigration and legal services. People have a lot of legal problems. They're constantly having legal problems, whether it's housing, you know, uh, you know, some programs don't even do will uh, or um, go over, you know, unnecessary legal programs, just necessary legal services that, that somebody adequately needs. So Paul, in, in that discussion, and when we're talking about food and nutrition services, we talked about A, increasing the rates to deliver these services to, to be more in line with um, the rate, standard rates throughout the city. Also, we're going to increase uh, the delivery of services to people. So we're, we're increasing by 250 people their availability to, to come to those services. And once the Food and Nutrition Service Directive is uh, processed through this uh, council, um, then we'll have a discussion about the allocation that we're currently setting for this year uh, for the future years to address, again, what you talked right, about. Right, but if we have 250 new people at 8.9, $1.9 million, how much how many more can we, uh, how many more people can enter at 2.6? Well, you know, this is an analysis that was provided to us that, that, that the committee felt collectively in that discussion was an appropriate amount to increase to that service category. The other dollar figures that are up here are also based on the data of overspending over a period of time. And uh, we use that uh, information to come up with the figures that are represented here. So it's not zero, and it's not one service category. We revisited that whole conversation and it back to the committee and, and took a different approach to uh, using the, these dollars that were now, had not become available to us through AF. So that's where we are at, at the moment, and um, I can respect, respect, respectfully disagree with you, but the rest of the council needs to know that you know, we did debate all these dollar amounts and dollar figures, and what's the best amount, and shouldn't it be higher, and you know, we had eight, you know, Sending back 8.5 million to ADA, why don't we make it 7.5 million or 6.5 million? We had those debates in that committee, and, and this is the plan that was approved and we brought forward to you to us. Not that that conversation won't happen again, but I think that it's an appropriate uh, step for us to take, especially given the fact that we've lost 3.1 percent of our work on top of all. So here we're, we're here we're sustaining a reduction in our award, but yet we have available to us another source of funding that we're going to continue to increase uh, programs that are desperately in need of additional dollars. So can I also make the, the observation that if we take it into account that we want to preserve dollars to cover anticipated, we anticipate that we will continue to have cuts to our to the to our formula allocate to our formula award and um, the cut that we absorb that we're going to absorb this year is one percent higher than we actually calculated for that we actually projected for. So I think taking a, a conservative approach at this point, first of all, you know, we calculated that out I believe to 2020, it's possible that um, you know we will continue to see reductions in awards past 2020. And so, you know, we really want to sort of take that into consideration so that we can observe the trends over the next few years and still have that, still have that cushion. So, I think that's one other consideration. And, and also, when we had this up before, we do have considerations for new categories for funding. I also want to make sure that, if in fact, that's something that the needs assessment committee and IOC and others say that we should be, in fact, exploring. We want to make sure there's something to fund that. So I think we're doing uh, as best we can be conservative but realistic and at the same time be able to make an impact on what we're trying to accomplish. Can you say the motion please so that we can move forward? Okay. Um, our, our motion is that we as the planning council accept our, um, our proposal as stated above to change the ADAP allocation to 8.596 million with increases to food and nutrition, uh, 
increases to legal services and supportive counseling based on what's listed here above. Okay, it doesn't need to have a second. It's coming directly from the committee to the council. Um, is there any further discussion on this? All right, seeing none, uh, let's move to a vote. All in favor? Raise your hands. What's the number, David? All, uh, all opposed? Then the uh, uh, recommendation passes. Thank you, Matt and Jan. And, and thank you, Paul, and for thank, asking these questions. Uh, thank you, Jan, for you and David. And I also want to say thank you. Jan and I, on our side, say thank you to our committee. It was a very spirited discussion. And I think we learned a lot of the whole process. And I think we're only going to get better at what we're doing. So thank you, everyone. And I just want to also thank Matt and Jan for your leadership. Um, Difficult process and you let it get plumb. I also want to um, give a shout out to Amber Casey, who uh, is the grantee representative on that committee and provided an incredible amount of information and guidance and was incredibly helpful. Take a deep breath. Uh, Paul, we're going to learn something new here. Um, Sarah, Sarah Bobby has uh, has brought to us uh, a, a new uh, uh, project that uh, many of us are going to be touched, uh, touched by. Um, and thank you, Sarah, for waiting so patiently. And, and I hope we can get through this in five hours of five. Um, Sarah has been working on this project for quite some time. She's been working on this presentation for quite some time. Um, she has shared it with uh, members of the uh, staff and uh, people have given her feedback on this. Um, it's a complicated topic. Um, so I would ask you to uh, hold your questions, uh, write them down, until uh, the end of the presentation. Um, it's, it's science, and it's science in a way that none of us had ever envisioned um, that we'd ever be at this place that we could use in the way that's being proposed here. So um, with that said, Sarah, it's my pleasure to welcome you here. I'm sorry, Adrian. Um, in this circumstance? No, no, if, if, if there's anyone, I'm, I'm happy to see my time to it's, it's Sarah. I, I actually don't need to present, I just want to call attention to um, my slides in, in the packet. The SIP report was released earlier this month, and I went through it and, and, and provided some talking points and some summaries for you. So please take a look and let me know if you have any questions. Um, this is just one of those circumstances where DRPH outbrings a JD. <laughs> very rare. Thank you so much for the introduction, Jan, and um, for to everyone for having me today. Um, I am a fast talker, but this is a topic that I don't like to speak quickly about, it, but I'm going to do my best to squeeze it all in. Um, so, um, yes, this is a new project that DOHMH is engaging in. Um, and it focuses on, it's a lengthy title, but it focuses on high impact prevention um, for Hispanic Latino MSM, um, including the use of molecular surveillance as a tool. Um, and I'm really privileged to be here to introduce this topic and describe it, uh, this project to the Planning Council today, as it will really need and benefit from ongoing community support as we begin the process. Uh, quick outline for my talk, I'll, talk a I'll do a little data talk uh, about trends in new HIV diagnoses among Latino and Hispanic MSM talk about the grant uh, that, that gave us this opportunity, and then give an overview of our planned activities, uh, including a bit of a deeper dive um, on molecular HIV surveillance, talk about our community engagement plans, and then end with a summary. So um, as this group knows well, New York City and the nation are working to end the HIV epidemic, um, but there are persistent disparities, especially by race ethnicity, um, in the distribution and the effects of HIV. Um, and given this, there's a strong focus, um, locally and nationally, on identifying and reducing those disparities. Um, here's a look at some national data from CDC using national HIV surveillance data to look at diagnoses in the United States um, with ranking by um, gender and race ethnicity among the most heavily affected subpopulations um, in 2016. And I've outlined, if you can see there, that Hispanic Latino MSM are the second most heavily impacted in terms of numbers of new diagnoses um, of the groups listed here. 
This is another slide showing national data uh, from, the, from the United States, looking at this time at the rate of HIV diagnoses. So the number of new diagnoses per population, um, again by gender and race ethnicity for the US in 2016. And here we can really see the important disparities in the epidemic and new diagnoses by race, ethnicity, and gender. So I actually did circle it, um, but you can see that the, oh my cursor doesn't show, um, but that among the males at the top, the top three bars, um, Hispanic males, um, three quarters or more of whom are men who have sex with men, um, have a, a diagnosis rate that is three times higher than for white men. So really highlighting the, the race ethnic disparities, in particular, the burden shouldered by Latino Hispanic MSM in the national epidemic. Um, drilling down locally to New York City, um, Hispanic Latino MSM are also heavily affected by HIV, um, and this graph shows the number of new diagnoses among MSM um, of the top four um, ethnic groups by uh, in New York City over a five-year period from 2012 to 2016. And you can see that the red line at the top is for Hispanic Latino MSM, and they are persistently have the highest number of new diagnoses um, over this period. Um, so both a, a high burden shouldered by this group, both nationally and locally. Um, and then finally, in terms of data, as background, this is the New York City HIV care continuum. I think a figure that I at least, I think, have presented to this group before, but hopefully you've seen elsewhere, showing engagement in the various stages of HIV um, diagnosis and care. Um, and this is specifically for Latino and Hispanic MSM in 2016. Um, and you can see that the, um, so this is a snapshot of where Hispanic Latino MSM are engaged in care in, in 2016. And, um, I'll just highlight the last bar, which is that we have data showing that 79% of this group um, is virally suppressed in 2016, um, and this compares to 76% citywide, 85% um, viral suppression among white MSM, and 71% uh, viral suppression among black MSM. Sarah? Yes. Um, just a quick question. So, 83, oh, I'm sorry, the, um, the chart here, the blue bars, are just Hispanic Latino. Yes. So that 85% would not, for white men, would not correlate to the 83% that you have up there. Does that would make sense? No. So, right. so I'm, I'm removing the orange. So yeah, these blue bars are just from Hispanic Latino. You know, I just wanted to do a quick com comparator to the citywide data and then for white and black MSM for viral suppression only, Thank which you. is that last part. So for Latino Hispanic MSM, they're slightly higher than the citywide uh, viral suppression proportion and then in between white, white and black MSM. Um, so, given, um, in response to these and other data that CDC uh, collects um, for trends among Latino and Hispanic MSM, CDC released a funding opportunity announcement last year for a three-year demonstration project uh, focused on enhancing high-impact prevention for Latino MSM. A demonstration project, um, it's kind of grant lingo, but it basically tests and measures the effect of a program um, in real-world situations. Um, and so this was a competitive funding opportunity for cities and states that had at least 500 new diagnoses among Hispanic Latino MSM. Um, four jurisdictions were awarded, and we were one of them, and specifically CDC awarded two city-state pairs, so New York City and New York State, and then Houston and Texas State Health Departments. Um, and they did this to very directly and um, specifically encourage a, a comprehensive, interjurisdictional approach to the high impact prevention activities that sites were going to do under this, this uh, project. So we will be collaborating closely with New York State on this, um, and Houston and Texas will be collaborating closely with one another. Um, so here's a schematic showing BHIV's uh, activities under this, this grant, um, which I will call by its grant number. We don't have any fun name for it yet. We need to come up with one. Um, but it's, we call it seven, well, it is called PS 171711, um, kind of a mouthful, but um, here, here are, is a schematic showing our, the suite of our activities. And so it's, it's really four main activities with one overarching one. Um, so in the, in the uh, one of those kind of triangles in the middle, there's molecular surveillance, which I'll talk about. Um, we'll be introducing a social marketing campaign to increase awareness of HIV uh, and improve, in, improve engagement in HIV prevention and care among Latino Hispanic MSM. Uh, we'll be doing a provider training of uh, providers for Hispanic Latino MSM 
to increase cultural and, and linguistic awareness and sensitivity. We'll be doing provider detailing, which I'll describe, um, for providers of Hispanic Latino MSM, also to increase engagement in prevention services. Um, and then underpinning and sort of surrounding all of this work will be work to engage with the community to identify and respond to needs ongoingly um, and to support successful implement implementation of this project. So uh, as a start to the project, we'll be doing, um, as a needs assessment for the work, um, formative research. So the formative research involves key informant interviews um, for which we've developed a recruitment strategy um, to ensure that we're collecting data from providers at a, a range of organizations that vary by type, by location, uh, the degree to which they, they service the LGBT population. Um, and we'll be doing eight to 16 key informant interviews with providers, um, as well as three to four focus groups to explore a range of topics that are relevant to this, this project. So things like provider knowledge, attitudes and practices regarding provision of PrEP and PEP, um, and other prevention services, their attitudes, experiences, working with Hispanic Latino MSM, um, and resources and training needs for working with Hispanic Latino MSM. So that formative research will inform um, really all of this work, uh, but very specifically uh, the next two pieces of our work, which are uh, a detailing, um, which will be, will be performing these detailing visits or basically visiting providers one-on-one, -on -one, um, just like pharmaceutical reps do when they're introducing a new product, um, but to encourage providers to improve their engagement of Hispanic Latino MSM patients in HIV prevention and care. Um, and this is something that builds on a long history uh, that the department has done with other sort of specific populations <coughs> and other topics. Um, but specifically, we'll be promoting through these visits to providers messages like uh, around sexual, the importance of taking a sexual history, screening for sexually transmitted infections, talking about PrEP and PEP, um, and then actually pre prescribing or referring for PrEP and PEP. Um, so that, that formative research I described will also uh, inform very directly our work developing a training for providers, both clinical and non-clinical providers, that will encourage and support their cultural and linguistically sensitive care, uh, prevention and care, for Hispanic Latino MSM. And the goal of the, the training will be um, a broad one, to uh, increase uh, Hispanic Latino MSM's awareness of their HIV status, their access to and utilization of prevention, testing, and sexual health services, um, improve their engagement and retention in prevention and care. Um, and the idea will be that we'll disseminate this training to locations, and venues um, where providers work to um, serve this, this population, and that we'll try to, as best as we can, extend knowledge throughout the system by providing online training um, and as many sort of venues for training as we possibly can. <coughs> Another arm of our project is to um, do social marketing that will improve uh, awareness of and engagement with prevention and care services for Latino Hispanic MSM. And so for here, for the social marketing, we'll be building on a, um, a recent health department campaign that just launched this month um, that focused on the uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP for Latinos, it's called Listos, um, and that we're going to tailor that campaign specifically for Latino Hispanic MSM. Um, this campaign is a unique one, I don't know if people have seen it, I have some images coming, um, but this was a, a, a first for the health department in, in that it was developed in Spanish uh, and then translated into English and it was largely placed in Spanish. Um, and so our plan is to develop a campaign kind of on the back of that, that broader one that, that focuses for Latino and Hispanic MSM and that will place the campaign strategically using a data-driven approach um, where Hispanic Latino MSM live, socialize, work, there'll be a multi-pronged placement um, outdoors, public transportation, um, in uh, digital, social media, and on the radio. Um, so in case you haven't seen some of these images, I just thought I'd show um, images from this recent health department campaign uh, for, uh, around PrEP for Latinos. Here's one of them in Spanish, the Lisos campaign. Um, here's its version in English. Here's another Spanish version of one of the images. And then here's the same one in English. Okay, so I'm going to just um, switch gears to kind of to, to do the deeper dive, and talk a little bit more in depth um, because it's it's the one of the newer pieces of this of our of our project here. 
um, but to talk about the molecular HIV surveillance piece. Um, but I'm going to start by talking about data to care. Um, and I think actually this is something I've also spoken to this group um, about. Just say yes. Um, but data to care is this idea, it's this kind of catchphrase, it's, it's this idea that the health department or health departments around the country um, should use or would use HIV surveillance data, specifically HIV laboratory tests that are reported to surveillance, um, with all of the usual privacy safeguards around those data, um, to identify people living with, with diagnosed HIV who may not be receiving medical care, um, and then take efforts and take steps to engage those persons in care. It's really the use of data for public health action. And it helps us, you know, very specifically also identify and do something about gaps and disparities in HIV care, which we know from our population level monitoring exist and persist. Um, so, for example, the way this kind of works is we'll, we can look in the HIV registry at our database and identify persons who haven't had an HIV-related CD4 count or an HIV laboratory, uh, viral load test in some time, which can flag to us that they may be not receiving consistent medical care, and then reach out to them through our field services unit um, to offer them assistance in reconnecting with care. This is an offer. Um, sometimes people can't be located. We make every effort to do so. And then if we are successful in locating a person, it's a conversation and it's an offer to offer health department assistance with returning them to care. Um, and I will say this data, this concept of data to care, or the use of surveillance data for public health action, has really become standard practice, not only for the, our health department, but all other health departments. And it's something that CDC is more and more um, encouraging and directly funding. So keep this concept of data to care in mind. Um, so I just kind of mentioned this, but um, our field services unit, which I think at least some of you are aware of, um, is the, the arm of my program that actually um, provides services to people um, newly diagnosed and living with diagnosed HIV and persons at risk of HIV infection. So one of the main kind of core activities that the Field Services Unit does is provide partner services to people newly diagnosed um, or previously diagnosed um, in which they interview those persons, um, ask them about their partners that they have been exposed and offer assistance with um, notifying those partners, we offer HIV testing for partners, and then linkage to care or linkage to PrEP or PEP as needed. Um, so, another, so that's a core activity of the field services unit. And another one is this data to care piece. And again, it's using sort of data from the surveillance registry to identify persons who may need help re-engaging with HIV care, or who may have been diagnosed with HIV and not yet linked to care. Um, you know, never linked in the first place. And the idea is, again, field services unit, um, attempts to locate those persons and approaches them with an offer of assistance. Um, and we've been doing that, that data to care work um, really for about 10 years now. We were one of the first jurisdictions to do, to do this work. Um, okay, I'm gonna jam, at least Jan, and other people I'm sure like multimedia. So I'm gonna show a little video to introduce this concept of molecular HIV surveillance. Uh, just click on it. So how is genetic testing used in HIV care? Well, this video helps explain how genetic science is currently used, how it might be used in the future, and also its limitations. The human immunodeficiency virus and acquired immunodeficiency syndrome still remain one of the biggest global challenges. However, we now have highly effective treatments for HIV, which have completely transformed the outcomes of having this disease. This is a pretty remarkable achievement and is a result of dedicated work from scientists around the world. Much of the research in HIV is focused on its genetics, which has revolutionized our understanding of the virus. However, this is a complex subject with complex terminology, so it's useful to go through the basics of how this science actually works. HIV, like you or I, is formed by and contains long nets of genetic material known as nucleic acids. They are formed from units called nucleotides, which are essentially the building blocks of all genetic material. In humans, this material comes in the form of DNA. In HIV, it comes in the form of what's known as RNA. As with humans, the genetic material within individual viruses is unique, but is most similar within its own viral family. This fact allows us to work out how different strains of viruses are related and where they might have originated from. 
two terms are important here, phylogenetics and genetic sequencing. Phylogenetics is a biological technique which determines evolutionary relationships between different organisms based on shared common features. Genetic sequencing is the process of finding out that unique order or sequence of nucleotides that make up a length of DNA or RNA. So let's look at phylogenetics. In HIV phylogenetics, the genetic sequences of different viruses are compared to one another in order to determine how closely related they are. With the addition of complex mathematical algorithms, a phylogenetic tree is produced which shows an estimation of the evolutionary history between different viral strains. Like a family tree of, say, the British royal family, shows the relationship between Queen Elizabeth and Queen Victoria, Phylogenetic trees, likewise, show the evolutionary relationship between different viruses. And so closely related groups of viruses might mean recent transmission between them. Phylogenetic analysis can be used to look at patterns of transmission of the virus within a certain population to see where, when, and how HIV is spreading. This can really help guide HIV prevention strategies. With improving techniques, it can now be used to detect and analyse new outbreaks of HIV in real time, which should allow us to better control and slow the spread of the virus. The data used in phylogenetic analyses comes directly from the viruses in question, and this is where genetic sequencing comes in. Within the UK, the majority of our HIV genetic sequence data is a result of routine drug resistance testing in those who are HIV positive. A section of the viral genetic sequence taken from a blood sample is isolated, then amplified to generate lots of copies. A section of data that's taken is the area of the HIV gene, where we know the majority of mutations that can cause resistance to antiretroviral drugs are present. This technique is useful, as it's cheap and widely available. But the downside is that only one section of the entire sequence is analysed. Therefore, if we only sequence one part of the genome, this means a lot of data isn't analysed. It's a bit like reading a book that has pages in some. It provides some information, but not the whole story. Therefore, new techniques called next generation sequencing have been developed to allow us to get more information from genetic data. The two most important techniques are whole genome. I'm actually going to pause there um, because the video goes on a little bit more, but give the, that gives the, the primary background um, on this, this idea. So I think, uh, okay, so I think as you just heard in the video, um, and I'm not able to consistently say HIV, but um, <laughs> although I do uh, admire. Um, but anyway, um, as you heard in the, in the video, um, clinicians order. As part of routine clinical care, clinicians order um, HIV genotypes for persons diagnosed with HIV. Um, this often is supposed to happen soon after someone is diagnosed, and so that the doctor can make the right treatment choice for that person. Um, in New York City, I'll just say that we have about 59% of people who are newly diagnosed with HIV do get an, a genotype within a few months after the diagnosis. And these tests, these HIV genotypes, are reported to DOH surveillance. Um, and since 2005 have been so. Um, we, we have a total of about 157,000 different sequences uh, representing about 70,000 people. Um, and so this concept that I described before of data to care, molecular HIV surveillance is data to care using HIV genotype tests um, that are reported to DOH. And the idea is that results from these genotype tests can be analyzed to identify networks of persons with genetically similar viruses. Um, and the hypothesis behind this is that doing so will give us information um, in, in addition to what we can learn by connecting people who are diagnosed with HIV with their named partners, which is what our field services unit does as a standard matter of practice. Um, and that based on this information, we can prioritize individuals in networks with potential for new infections for field outreach like partner services, HIV testing, linkage to care, re-engage in the care. Our usual interventions that we offer to people could be prioritized for people who are in um, networks. Um, I'll just say that you know, New York City has many people living with HIV who are not engaged optimally or at all in HIV care or treatment. And so you know, 
Well, ideally, we would be able to reach all of those persons and offer them our assistance, but we do need mechanisms for prioritizing people to offer that assistance to. And so this molecular HIV surveillance is one of the ways that we are prioritizing people. Um, the, the video also described this, so I won't go into lengthy detail here, but the idea is that there are sequences from these genotypes that are available to us, and we identify pairs of sequences that are very similar, so A and B here, and B and C, and that, then we do an analysis by computer that connects all similar pairs to identify specific clusters. Um, and you know, I've mentioned it a couple times, but you know, I think it's a very valid question is why do this molecular analysis of genotypes when we do have standard partner services that we offer to people newly diagnosed with HIV, where we ask those persons um, if they can name or are willing to name their HIV uh, potential partners who have been exposed, um, and that we can connect people that way. Um, but you know, this does this has the potential to give us more information than just providing partner services. People may not be able to name partners. People may choose not to. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, not, it's a choice. Um, people may name partners whose HIV virus is very genetically distant from theirs, um, meaning that they may not be in the same network at all. Um, and so the combination, and this, this is an example from a, a, a cluster that was published on in, from San Antonio, Texas, but the combination of in orange or red dots there, the genetic partners that were linked through analysis of the genotype data, and then overlaying um, those persons' named partners from the sort of routine partner services that the health department offered in the blue dots, more fully characterizes um, people's connections to one another and brings to sort of the attention of the health department more people who may benefit from health department assistance with linkage to care, um, to HIV testing, PrEP, and PEP, et cetera. So what, how are we going to do this under 1711, this new grant? Um, we'll be identifying clusters or networks um, involving newly diagnosed Hispanic MSM. Um, and then providing, as I've been describing, the, these, these field out, uh, outreach or data to care interventions to members of those networks who appear to be out of care or who may be in care um, but may need assistance with sort of more optimal engagement in care or treatment adherence. Um, and then we'll also be providing ongoing partner services to um, other network members um, in terms of HIV testing and referral for prevention services. Uh, we will be collaborating very closely with New York State and actually doing the cluster, the genotype analysis, um, in a way using both city and state data so that we can identify clusters that may cross the sort of jurisdictional boundaries between New York State and New York City. Um, and that will just enhance the reach um, and the, through this collaboration with New York, New York State. I do quickly want to mention, and I know I'm over time, so I'm going to be really fast in these last few slides, um, that there are some important points around the limits um, and the ways in which we are using molecular surveillance. So using the technologies that are available um, you know, it is not possible to suggest or to, to interpret direct transmission of HIV from one person who's linked, whose virus is linked to another person's virus. All we are able to do is make the linkage by comparing the, the sequences of those two viruses, but we don't know anything about the directionality, uh, whether those persons um, are even linked directly through transmission. Um, they, as a, the people show at the bottom, these different scenarios, they, those two people may have been infected by a third person, um, or those two people could be in the same kind of what looks like a transmission chain, but that there are people in between them that we don't even know about that may be living with undiagnosed HIV infection, may be living with diagnosed HIV infection but haven't yet connected to care. Um, they may have connected to care but not yet get an HIV, gotten an HIV genotype. So there are many, many scenarios um, that really limits our ability to make these kinds of interpretations using these data. Uh, and I will, just even beyond that, I think the point I really would like to emphasize is that, you know, this, that sort of forensic purpose is, is not our purpose. The, as I've described, you know, we have been have a long history of using other types of surveillance data um, to identify people who may need our, or may benefit from our services. And the use of these genotypes and doing molecular analyses is just yet another tool for us to identify people that um, may that may need our help. Um, as with any work we do ever with surveillance data, uh, but including this project, um, you know this work will have our standard patient and data protections and security, which are of the highest highest priority to us. 
Um, and I will just you know say or remind this group that you know HIV surveillance and public health laws in New York State and New York City are long, long established, very stringent. Um, we in our in my program at the health department treat patient confidentiality with the highest protocol, uh, our highest priority, and have extensive protocols to protect our data and protect patient confidentiality. Um, I will say also specifically that we sought advice and approval and counsel from our general counsel's office at the DOH um, before embarking on any of this work um, and got their approval to, to do so that this fits within our, our legal and uh, use of surveillance data. There have been a number of ethical consultations around molecular HIV surveillance, including one in New York City uh, that we had a couple of years ago, uh, almost a couple of years, a year and a half ago. Um, and all of these ethical consultations, all of which my, you know, myself and or my team have been involved in, um, have raised important issues and topics that um, you know, we and others are very much thinking through around concerns around that, that establishment of directionality that I talked about in transmission, um, you know, the fact of um, some states still have HIV criminalization laws on the books, although of course New York State does not, just ensuring in general that the benefits of this outweigh any risks, talking about best practices for approaching individuals. Um, and I will say that from out of our consultation back in September of 2016, it was that we brought together a range of community members, consumers, um, experts in the era, area, bioethicists, other surve uh, surveillance folks, scientists, academicians, um, a range of people, and there was broad support for kind of using the data in this public health action way. That if we have the power to prioritize more people to receive health department services, that we should be doing that. Um, and I'll just close by saying that um, not only for the molecular HIV surveillance portion of this project, but for the range of activities that we'll be engaging in under 1711, um, community engagement and support is going to really be critical. Um, you know, it's, it's starting, I would say now, um, with this, this first engagement with the Planning Council. I'll be presenting to the HIV Planning Group next week, or in, in next month. Um, we are also forming a dedicated community advisory board um, that we would like, that we are going to ask to um, ongoingly advise us on this project. Um, and as part of the engagement today and then afterwards, we really welcome your thoughts on members for the Community Advisory Board and its composition, most effective composition. Um, and we're also planning to hold community listening sessions to, in general, understand barriers on that need um, and issues related to prevention and care for Latino and Hispanic MSM. Um, just a summary, um, we're excited about this project. It's um, a, a lofty one to undertake in just a few years, a couple years. Um, it's, it is innovative and it's cross-cutting uh, throughout our bureau, which is very unique for us. It really involves nearly all of the bureau's programs. Uh, and so this, this is sort of an ultimate collaboration, which is, is exciting. Um, it's, it's focus on identifying and addressing disparities is one that is very much in keeping with our bureau's um, mission and mandate to reduce health equity, uh, dis uh, health disparities around HIV. And it builds on a lot of our past and current programming at work. And as I mentioned, community engagement is a critical piece of this. Um, lots of acknowledgments to lots of people who contributed to this, including people like Jan and others, um, to whom I, I did a run through of this a few weeks ago. Um, and I'll just leave with my contact information and welcome any feedback after today, uh, questions to be directed to me. I'm happy to engage in those conversations and really welcome you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Sorry that we put the squeeze on you with regard to time. Um, are there questions? We're about 10 minutes over time, so we'll keep the meeting short. Lisa? Yeah, um, thank you for a really wonderful presentation that probably would have hurt my brain at another time. Um, but you did mention something midway that I find very important, the cultural uh, sensitivity and training. Because from a consumer perspective, a lot of these very intrusive and personal questions, we can detect when someone is uncomfortable or they have no experience, and you will not get an accurate answer if I'm made to feel uncomfortable. So thank you for mentioning that. Thank you for that comment. Oscar? Just as a, all Latinos are not the same, please don't put white Latinos and black Latinos in the same box. 
Our experiences are very different based on our skin color. And so I just want you to take that into consideration when you create images that don't reflect the Latino community as a whole. You can actually be doing more damage than good. And I will say, um, you know, one of the major, one of our primary interests in, in holding these meetings, with community listening sessions, is to hear from as diverse a set of voices as we can. No, we sound good. Any other questions, Billy? I just wanted to know the video. Where can we find the video? Yeah, I was thinking that I'm not sure if the link showed up in the handout. Um, I can, I'll send the link to Jan, and Jan can distribute it. Because yeah, it's, it's a good video, and there, I did cut it off a little early, so there's more. So, so um, very lovely. I hope you do really engage the community, and I cross her say we are quite diverse, really diverse. And one example is the, the promotion that was made, and I think we, the panelists, have found that to be a very complicated circumstance of having translators, I don't know who, who did the work, but at least those, not what it means there. For, especially when you, this is geared to Spanish-speaking immigrants who have not yet been immersed completely into the American way of phrasing things. So be ready sounds good. And though you said that it came from Spanish to English, it, Whoever did the Spanish first is already influenced by English. So he already made a poster that readily translates to English because it's a perfect match. These books, depending on the intonation and how you read it, mean several things. Listo can mean you are you are smart. Listo, depending again, in between those two those two exclamation points. To my advice was that needed a verb to make sure that that term is uh, understood as an action. Uh, it doesn't clearly give an action because these can mean several things for a Latin American person. And it depends on how you read it. Uh, again, I hope that any kind of advertising or any kind of involvement, as Oscar said, involves the understanding that the the Latino community is diverse in between those who are born here, maybe third generation, second generation, the first generation, and then those who immigrate and those who are undocumented. There's a difference between those who immigrate legally and then those who are, come undocumented. It, it, those things will guide your work. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, the F, when you talk about MSM, uh, and special immigrant communities, uh, and again, I'll just reduce it to my experience in Queens, and I'm a gay person. Uh, so it, it, it's interesting that when you do your work, uh, you, you really consider geography of the city. Uh, you really consider uh, not only geography, but population it, 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 within neighborhoods. Because you, if you want true data to help you and guide you, you really have to look at the neighborhoods and the structure. Uh, like most immigrants, we clutter in certain neighborhoods. And it's, it's again, it could be an immigrant. For example, again, I would say Corona, uh, Jackson High, and Elmer is immigrant undocumented, basically. And, and they, the majority of the work for there is no longer works on, on restaurants, they do construction. You can see it in the morning. And many of them are, you know, they're, 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 So please do, when you do those things, don't use your methods that you have used for the white population, American white population, this is a different population. We spread differently across the boroughs. Bronx is a different kind of immigration. Uh, Population number in Spanish from Upper Manhattan, from Brooklyn. So take care of it because again, like I said, and I think Lisa said, when you're trying to when you talk about providers and how to help make you help on your project, providers are also are thought of doing the same thing when you're discussing. Thank you so much. All right, uh, thank you all for hanging in there. Uh, thank you, Sarah, so much again. I apologize. 